So again, welcome. Flying safely while aging gracefully. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And so let me give you a little bit of a background of where this all came from. Um, back about 15, maybe longer, maybe 18 or 20 years ago, I was taking a look at the data, the accident and the incident data for our FISDO, the Portland Maine FISDO, which covers Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And I was starting to see a trend. I was starting to see that older pilots were being involved in accidents and incidents, and more and more older pilots were being involved in the accidents and the incidents. volunteers that help us with this program and I called a couple of them that were high time designated pilot examiners and high time pilots one of them was a designated pilot examiner in Vermont who had actually retired from TWA as a 747 fleet manager and the other was a high time pilot examiner in New Hampshire who had started his own helicopter business and and uh, had been running that for many decades and we started to talk about it and we came up with the thought that we should put together some type of a safety seminar. And of course, back then we didn't have the technology for webinars. So we wanted to put together a seminar and we wanted to put it together with a common theme. And what that theme was, was, was that we knew that if we went out and we told pilots that as they got older, they had to stop flying, that nobody was gonna listen. And that wasn't what we wanted to say anyway. What we wanted to say was, how do you deal with the effects of aging, continue to fly, and do it safely. And so we put together this seminar and we call it Flying Safely While Aging Gracefully. Now, if you've been out there searching around on the, on the internet, you may have seen that AOPA also has a course called Aging Gracefully, Flying Safely. Pretty similar, right? Well, I would highly encourage you if you have the opportunity to take that course because there are things that that course covers that our webinar today won't cover and vice versa. It's a great course. You can go to Google, just type it into the search engine, AOPA Aging Pilot, it will pop up and you'll be able to take a look at that. So why talk about this? Well, let's take the 30,000 foot view and let's see where we are as far as age is concerned. So back in 1971, the average pilot was 35 and a half years old. Now that's taking the data from 600 plus thousand pilots. So where does the average fall? Well, back then, it fell at 35 and a half years old. In 1994, it was 42 years old. And today, it's 44 and a half years old. So our pilot population is aging. And back when I put this seminar together as a seminar instead of a webinar, I was around 44 years old or so. And, you know, I guess I had a credibility problem, right? I'd get up in front of an audience and talk to them about aging, and I was 44 years old. Well, I'm 62 today, so I'm much more credible. I, I am living what I'm talking about. So how do these numbers play out? Well, 42% of our pilots are over 50 years old. Now, what this takes into account are student pilots through airline transport pilots. So that includes recreational pilots and sport pilots and private pilots and commercial pilots and, air, of course, airline transport pilots. What it doesn't take into account is it doesn't take into account our remote pilots. They haven't been factored into this average age equation. Nonetheless, looking at the 600,000 plus pilots that we have out there right now, 42% are over 50 years old, 23% are over 60 years old. So let's find out with this audience out here, and I'm looking at 882 of you that are attending today, let's find out by having a poll question just to see how old the rest of you are. So I'm gonna launch this poll. If I can get it to launch, is it launching? I uh, don't see it yet. I do have the capability on my end too, John, if you want. Yeah, Steve, um, uh, let me give it one more good college try. It looks like it should, but it's not. So why don't you try launching it from your end, see if you can do it. There we go. Okay. And I can see it better than you this time. So would you like me to <laughs> just read it off? <laughs> would, you, would you please? It, yeah. it takes a team, doesn't it? It takes yeah, a team. Thank it you. does. You know, and please, folks, vote early, vote often. But um, just so we have an idea of what our audience is out there, um, you know, my age is, and please select 
one of the following. You're younger than age 40, age 40 to 49, age 50 to 59, age 60 to 69, or the last answer is 70 and older. And uh, we're actually already up through 90% um, of you have voted, which is excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. And just so you have an idea, right now as I'm reading this, we do have 885 people in attendance as we're approaching 95%. So um, this gives you a very, very good idea of uh, what this type of audience is. I'm going to go ahead and close it, John. Okay, Steve. One minute, and I'm also now going to share it. And here's what we have, is we actually had 0% younger than age 40. Uh, we have 2% that are in the um, age 40 to 49 group. Um, you know, we have age 50 to 59 is 11% of us out there. Age 60 to 69 is 42% of us out there. And age 70 and older is 45%. So we definitely do have an audience that is skewed at the upper half of the general aviation pilot group uh, today. All right. Did you want to say anything more about this, or you want me to go ahead and hide this and move on? You can go ahead and hide this, Steve. And I just wanted to say, based on those results, welcome. You're my people. <laughs> yes, you're our people. <laughs> you, you are our people. Yeah. You really are. Exactly. This is wonderful. Okay, Steve. Once so you, you close that up, I, I did. You just need to hit share on your screen um, again, and we should start seeing it. Okay. Yeah, it there should we be go. coming back. In yep. There we okay, go. there Excellent. we go. Thank you. There me. we go. Great. Great. And thank you, Steve. Appreciate that help. So, based on that, looking at the answers to that poll question and what we've talked about just to this point, let me ask you something. Do we need to be concerned? What do you think? You don't have to type in your answer into the question pane, but just think about it for a couple of seconds. We have an aging pilot population. Is that just a statistic? Is that just an interesting piece of information? Or is there a need to be concerned about that? And if there is, if there is, why? Why do we need to be concerned? So to try to answer that question, we need data. And in order to get data, we have to run studies. So how do we do that? What, what is it that we do? Well, when we're trying to gather data about whether age matters, about whether we have to be concerned, we can attack it from a couple of different points of view. The first is that we can analyze the accident data. So we can go into the, into the databases and we can take a look. And we can find those accidents that have happened to older pilots. And we can take a look at the causal factors. We can try to draw inferences and try to draw conclusions based upon what we see. But that's a difficult place to go. It's really hard to base a conclusion about whether age matters on accident data because there are so many variables. Did the accident happen or was that causal factor related to the pilot's age or was it not? It's really kind of hard to, to make that conclusion. So we have another method by which we can try to address the question and that is that we can measure performance. We can measure performance in an aircraft or perhaps even better, we can measure pilot performance in simulators. And we can try to answer the question about whether age matters and therefore whether we have to be concerned based on the data that we get by measuring performance. Well, we've done that. We've measured performance. And we have tended to do it, or most of our studies tend to be around the professional pilot group. Why? Well, because it's an easy group to measure performance because it's already being measured. Professional pilots are in a regular checking and a regular training 
arena. They have initial training, they have recurrent training, they have their initial check rides, they have their recurrent check rides. We can follow pilots as they age and we can see what the results happen to be. Most of our original professional pilot studies from an aging perspective were done back in the 60s, 50s, 60s. In 1960, the FAA instituted what's called the age 60 rule. And basically what it said was if you were flying a transport category aircraft under part 121, that you could not continue to do that past your 60th birthday. Now that was instituted in 1960. So the data for that to re reach that conclusion came from studies that were done back in the, in the 50s and maybe even dating back into the 40s a bit. And the decision was made that 60 years old was the point at which we wanted airline pilots to step away from an airline cockpit. Well, in the last decade, we've had to revisit that. The International Civil Aviation Organization has a number of member countries of which the United States is one. And a number of those member countries had done studies on their own. And they had decided based on their studies that we no longer are back in the 60s, that we're now in a new millennia. And that with the medical technology we have today, with the focus on nutrition and health that pilots have today, that maybe they could boost that age. And they started to. And we had member countries, ICAO member countries, who were actually boosting that mandatory retirement age up to 65 years old. And so pressure was put on the AOP, on the, excuse me, on the, the FAA to take a look and revisit that data ourselves. And we did. And what we concluded was that it was perfectly safe and a perfectly viable option to bring that, re that basically retirement age up to 65, and that has been done. And so now, if you fly a transport under Part 121, you can no longer fly past your 65th birthday. But one of the things that, one of the factors that pro pilots had going for them when these studies were done is that they were highly experienced. And we're talking people that have lots of flight hours. They were in regular structured training, they operated in a crew environment. They had regular strict health evaluations. If you're flying left seat in a 121 aircraft, you have a first class medical every six months you're seeing your doc. They have excellent equipment and they have great support systems. But what about, what about the general aviation pilot? What type of studies have been done for the general aviation pilot? Well, again, I'm going to put a plug in here for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and for their Air Safety Institute. Because in 2007, the Air Safety Institute commissioned a large scale scientific study on the performance of older GA pilots in real non-simulated flight. It was to be carried out by an academic partner. But due to a series of setbacks, most of them related to difficulties establishing a sufficiently large group of subject pilots. It eventually became obvious that the project could not be completed within a reasonable time frame and budget, and the study was terminated. But when the limited results that were obtained from that study were handed over to the Air Safety Institute, an analysis suggested an overall pattern in which a pilot's ability to control the aircraft, comply with ATC instructions, and respond to emergencies declined with age, but, but improved with accumulated flight experience. And these effects appeared to be largely independent of one another. Older pilots were not quite as sharp as younger pilots who had similar amounts of experience. However, given sufficient experience, older pilots performed better than their younger counterparts. These conclusions should not be given too much weight due to issues with the sample size and the study design but they do appear to fit into the general pattern established by other work in this area. So how do we interpret the studies, especially the general aviation studies? Those are the ones that we're focusing on and those are the ones that we're talking about today. Where are general aviation pilots? How do we interpret what the limited studies we have out there have given us for a conclusion? Well, it's complicated, it's complicated.
So let me read something to you that comes from that handout that I included, which was the AOPA's aging pilot report. And here's what it says. The studies and reports represent a number of different approaches to the question of aging in the cockpit. Vision, memory, cognition, accident involvement, airmanship, and health have all been investigated across various segments of the pilot population. Yet for all the work that's been done, what is perhaps most striking is a relative absence of exact findings. The questions seem to resist efforts in analysis. Indeed, it's tempting to conclude that the question of aging may be a red herring. That is, as the saying goes, there is no there, there. But that overstates things. The situation is extraordinarily complicated from a research standpoint, and there's ultimately no and steepness of that decline very tremendously. There are 60-year-old pilots whose true age is closer to 90, and vice versa. But the decline always comes. And as with many things in life, we are talking about a bell-shaped curve. Only a lucky handful of us will still be flying safely and confidently at 90. In general, and in short, age matters. So let's look at what the general study results are. What is it that we were able to pull out? What were the common themes across the board? Well, there's no one single older pilot profile. Some pilots perform better at older ages than pilots that are a decade or two younger than them and vice versa. Different pilots age differently. And in this, I think, is the one that you should kind of clasp onto. Experience and currency are great equalizers. So the more experience you have and the more current you are, the safer you will be as you age. So let's talk a little bit about the effects of aging. And we're gonna break this up into a number of different areas. We're gonna talk about the effects on vision, the effects on hearing, physical fitness, cognition and memory, and of course, the effects that aging has on us mentally and emotionally. So let's start with vision. So here are some of the things that we have to be concerned with from a vision perspective as we age. And the first one there is presbyopia. And what is presbyopia? Well, presbyopia means you need reading glasses. Now, why does that happen? Well, the aqueous humor, which is the fluid that is inside the lens of your eye, starts to harden. Uh, some of you probably have experienced floaters. Um, little pieces break off and those act as floaters and you, you'll see floaters kind of in your field of vision. But as that hardens, it makes it more difficult for that lens to accommodate. And by accommodate, what happens is the lens actually has to flatten a bit in order for you to see near objects. And you can imagine if the fluid inside becomes harder or more resilient to that, and the lens can't flatten as much, suddenly you find yourself needing reading glasses. So I'll tell you a story out of my past. I have a friend who flew for American Airlines. He's now retired and he's six years older than me. And about the time I was 50, he called on the phone and he said, hey, you have a birthday coming up, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do. And he said, you're turning 50. I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, you know, you're going to need reading glasses. I said, buddy, no, I'm not going to need reading glasses. I, I, I haven't needed reading glasses. I'm fine. I, I, I don't need reading glasses. He said, okay, okay. And, uh, and he hung up. Well, about a month later, I was trying to read something and I noticed, well, I had to kind of hold it a little bit further away to see it. <laughs> so, so anyway, a little bit more time went by and now I was, I was turning 60 and, uh, and he called and, and we were talking and he said, you're turning 60, right? I said, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna sleep as well anymore. I said, oh, come on. I said, I, I, I sleep like a log. I have no trouble sleeping. Well, about two or three months later, I started to toss and turn at night and had trouble sleeping. And so I've finally found a way to deal with all this. I just don't take any more phone calls from this guy. I'm just, that's, that's it. No more phone calls from, from him. I don't, I don't want to know what's coming next. But anyway, presbyopia, you're going to need reading glasses. Uh, contrast sensitivity is, um, well, the pupils, you know, one of the things that happens is that the pupils 
uh, start to shrink a little bit, less light reaches the photoreceptors. And by the age of 60, uh, the, amount reaching, the amount of light reaching the photoreceptors is only about 33% of that that we have at age 20. And by our late 70s, it's only about 12% of that. And so a couple of things that that does is it causes contrast sensitivity. I mean, it's more difficult to pick things out, to, to tell one object from another object. And where this is particularly true is it's particularly true in times of reduced visibility. So if you're still flying IFR, if you're out there flying IFR and you're taxiing around the airport, it's a little bit foggy, um, it's raining, it's snowing, you have the reduced visibility, um, or nighttime, twilight, especially at twilight, there was a, a videotape that was put out by AAA a number of years ago. And it, it shows you how long ago it was because it was a VCR tape. And it was called The Older and Wiser Driver. And I don't know if that's still available. Maybe someplace on the internet you can find it. But one of the, um, of course, it, it talked about basically what we're talking about here, but how it affects somebody driving the car. And what was interesting was at one point in that videotape, it splits the screen. And it's a nighttime scene and it's a lawn with some bushes on it. And there are two people walking toward you. And on the left side of the screen, it shows you what that would look like if you were 20 years old. And on the right side of the screen, it shows you what that would look like if you were 60 years old. And you can see the people walking toward you on the left side of the screen with the 20 year old eyes long before you can see the people walking toward you on the right side of the screen for the 60 year old eyes. And that is a question of the amount of light that's hitting the photoreceptors and it has to do with contrast sensitivity. Now, this can also affect your depth perception, your peripheral vision. As you get older, your ability to discern objects that are outside your main focal area that are on the periphery becomes uh, more difficult. It becomes more difficult to do. It'll affect your night vision. And of course, eye pathology. And eye pathologies are issues that sometimes older folks run into when they develop glaucoma or macular degeneration or other particular pathologies of the eye. So how can these things affect us? I mean, as pilots, so, okay, the, these are the issues that we may have to deal with, but how does this affect us as pilots? Let's give some examples. Well, it can make it more difficult to distinguish signs and markings. Again, in reduced visibility situations, it's even worse. Glare from lights, have you noticed this? For our group out there that are older, have you noticed the glare from lights, especially at night? I know that when I'm driving at night and it's raining and there's an, a car approaching the opposite direction, I, you know, it, I'm often blind, literally often blind with seeing what might be in front of me as that car gets close because the combination of the headlights from that car, the wet surfaces, the glare off the wet surfaces, you're just hoping that a deer doesn't step out in front of you. Um, so that can be an issue. Um, a 60-year-old takes 20 times longer to recover from glare than a 20-year-old, which is why when that car passes, you're still a little bit blind for a little bit of time because it just takes that much longer to recover. Um, so judging height and judging distance, your distance from another aircraft, your height above the ground, where to flare, and of course, trouble seeing other traffic. So what can we do about it? Well, here's what we can do about it. Current prescriptions, make sure that we have current prescriptions and to do it annually, to get together with an ophthalmologist. Now we can go into the local shopping mall and we can walk into the vision store there and get together with an optometrist. But as we get older, it's important to get together with somebody who can actually, who actually specializes in diseases of the eyes or pathology of the eyes so that we can get that really thorough evaluation. Um, avoid glasses with side pieces. Why? Well, we already have issues with peripheral vision and adding side pieces to it only exacerbates that. No sunglasses or tinted lenses at night. Now, that sounds foolish, right? But okay, so again, a story out of my past is I was a young flight instructor and I was working through a college program. So we had a, a whole group of new students that would come in in September and they all seem to reach about the same point about the same time. So most of September and October, you were, as a flight instructor, were in the traffic pattern and it was day after day of takeoffs and landings and just practicing in the traffic pattern. And I was working with a student one day and we were going to do some night takeoffs and landings and, and uh, we launched right about sunset. Big ball of orange on the horizon as that sun started to set and I had my sunglasses on and 
we went out to the practice area and we practiced a little bit. We came back into the traffic pattern and we started in with our, our takeoff and landing practice. And it was a towered airport. And as we were going around the traffic pattern, we would call on the downwind and the tower would call out traffic. And again, it was, it was a little bit busy in the traffic pattern because we had all those college students who were all at about the same point in their training at the same time. And I noticed that it was getting harder and harder for me to see the traffic. And the student sitting in the left seat didn't have any trouble at all seeing it. And, and uh, at one point, uh, they called out traffic on a base that we were to follow. And I just couldn't seem to pick out that traffic. And, and the student said, he's right there. And then he kind of looked over at me and he said, you know, it, it would actually be easier on you if you took off your sunglasses. And I was still wearing my sunglasses. So yeah, you know, you're not going to put your sunglasses on when it's night, but you might be wearing them as the sun goes down. And so just remember to take them off and consider oxygen. Um, you know, there's uh, nothing wrong with carrying some supplemental oxygen on board that aircraft and using it, particularly if you are operating at night. Um, the typical recommendations are over 5,000 feet at night, um, but you know, try using it at a lower altitude and see if that helps to improve things. Uh, make sure that your windshield's clean and make sure that the seat height is where it needs to be. And this is particularly true for the renters. If you're renting an aircraft, I mean, who knows the pilot before you, whether they were short, whether they were tall and how they adjusted, especially the height of the seat. And so make sure when you climb in that aircraft that the seat height is adjusted before you start the engine and before you start taxiing to the seat height that's best for you. Okay, let's talk about hearing. Auditory discrimination. What do you say? And, and then of course, hearing pathology. And auditory discrimination is the ability to pick out a voice from background noise or from background voices. Just the ability to pick that out. And so how can that play itself out? And how can that affect us in an airplane? Well, so what did he say? listening to a transmission from ATC and not being sure what was said, the miscommunications, misinterpreted communications, and mis missed warnings and noises that are emanating perhaps from inside the cockpit from your own avionics, an altitude alerter, from your own uh, gear warning horn, um, missing those type of things. Um, the what did he say is actually kind of important. And it, it's funny because this at six, now I'm 62 years old and at 62 years old, this is one of the things I run into. And in fact, it's, it's interesting when I'm watching movies with my wife at night, um, you know, it's somewhat often I'll end up saying what he say. And so I finally did something about it and I, we, we stream movies and I went out looking for a streaming device that would be helpful. And I finally found one. And the particular streaming device I, I picked out, and I, I, I won't mention the, the manufacturer here just because I don't want to show favoritism, but the one that I picked out, you can press down a button and speak to it. And often in a movie, what I'll do is I'll press down that button and I actually say the words, what did he say? And what the streaming device does is it backs the movie up 10 seconds and it throws the captions up. And then it will play for the next 10 seconds with the captions up and then the captions go away. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's saving my marriage. The genius who invented that, I'd like to shake his hand someday, but it's a great device. But where you really notice this is, um, are you at, when you're at a restaurant, if you're at a restaurant and you're at a group of a table with a group of people and there's a lot of background noise, um, can you understand what's being said by somebody just down you know, a few seats down from you. Um, often the person across from you, you can understand the person beside you, you can understand. But what about the person that's, that's down just a few seats from you? Um, anytime that there's uh, some type of background noise or, or do you feel that when people are talking to you that it sounds mumbled? Uh, it seems like they're not pronouncing their words fully. Um, if so, it's probably a kind of a normal hearing loss that you're experiencing as you get older. So what can we do about it? Well, here's what we can do. We can get annual hearing exams. Now, I know that I, in, when I have background noise in a, like a restaurant setting, I have trouble picking out what people are saying 
and I go for my hearing exam, and what they tell me is you've got very mild hearing loss, but you're, you're perfectly within the parameters for where you should be for your age. And yet, I suffer from that auditory discrimination situation uh, mildly, but it's there. So an annual hearing exam, and what that annual hearing exam will do is it will let you know whether you need to take the next step. It will identify if there are any pathologies and let you know what you can do about it and if you have to do something about it. One of the things you can do in the aircraft is you can use an active noise canceling headset, which will drown out some of that background noise and it will, it will actually neutralize it. Um, briefing the passengers, and I can't put enough emphasis on how important that is. Um, you should be fully briefing passengers anyway. But if you were to say to your passengers something along the lines of, when we're under 2,000 feet, or when we're under 3,000 feet, it's going to be very busy. I'll be taxiing out. I'll be talking with the tower. I'll be looking for traffic. I'll be dealing with departure control. So when we're under, let's say, let's call it 3,000 feet. When we're under 3,000 feet, I need you to be as quiet as possible. Now, if you see something out the window that alarms you, if you see another aircraft heading for us, or you, you feel a particular vibration, or there's something that you consider to be a safety item, yes, bring that up to me. But otherwise, otherwise, if you, if you could stay as quiet as possible, that'd be really helpful to me. Now, the passengers probably won't know when you're below 3,000 feet or 2,000 feet or whatever you set as that ceiling. And so you can tell them. You just tell them in the briefing, I'll let you know when we are above 2,000 feet and it's okay to start talking. I'll let you know um, when we're descending back below 2,000 feet as we approach an airport and we need to be quiet. And you can even borrow the term from the, our airline friends of a sterile cockpit and tell them you need to have a sterile cockpit when you're below that particular altitude and you'll inform them when you're below that particular altitude. Another thing that you can do is ask ATC to repeat. If you don't understand what they're saying, don't assume that you heard it well. If what you heard was taxi via Alpha Charlie and then it kind of faded out, don't assume that you're to take Charlie all the way to the ramp. What he may have said was taxi via Alpha Charlie holds short of runway 16. And that was the part that you missed. Or taxi via Alpha Charlie Kilo. In Kilo was the part that you missed. So ask ATC to repeat something if you don't understand it and hearing aids, and that can be a, 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 that can bring a vast improvement to your ability to discriminate what you're hearing. Okay. Physical fitness, the areas where we start to see a degradation as we get older, usually with our strength and our endurance, our dexterity and our mobility. Now I can remember going to, I've, I've worked with weights just for a tone most of my life, and I can remember going to see my doc when I was 50 years old, and I was, I was getting tendonitis in my elbows a bit, and, and we started to talk about it, and he said, well, how much weight are you lifting? And I told him, and, and he said, you know, you're still lifting the type of weight that you were lifting when you were 30. He said, you know, when, when we're in our 20s and 30s and 40s, he said, particularly for a guy, it's, a, it's, a, it's about strength. And, and, uh, and he said, but now that you're getting into your 50s and, and, and on, he said, it, it's really about flexibility. It's about protecting those joints. And, uh, and I have noticed, I have noticed that I, I can't do the things that I used to be able to do. And I don't have the endurance that I, I used to have. So how can that affect us when we fly? Well, we become fatigued on long flights, especially if it's an IMC, or especially if it's at night. We're more susceptible to hypoxia. And so that's another reason to maybe carry some supplemental oxygen with you. Uh, from a dexterity point of view, trouble turning knobs or trouble pushing buttons. And maybe from a mobility point of view, trouble ingressing or egressing the aircraft. Some aircraft are more difficult to get into and out of than others, and that can be an issue. So what can we do about it? Well, regular exercise, and that includes stretching. And regular exercise is one of the most important things you can do in general for your health. And it doesn't have to be high impact exercise. It doesn't have to be exercise with heavy weights. 
It can be the exercise that you get by walking. It can be the exercise you get by riding a bike. It can be the exercise that you get by moving and getting out there regularly and doing your gardening and pushing your lawnmower across the lawn. Nutrition and hydration, which are very important to keep us fit. Making sure that we drink enough water, making sure that we get enough fluids, and making sure that the foods that we eat are nutritious foods. Now, the last time you took a flight out to an outlying airport someplace and you walked into the FBO, you probably walked right up to that vending machine, put your money in and, and got out your, your carrot and hummus sandwich on wheat bread and, and a V8 juice, right? No, likely not. Likely what you got were peanut butter crackers and maybe a Coke. And so it's important to address the fact that we have to be focused on nutrition and eating foods that are gonna aid our bodies in staying as healthy as possible. Sleep is vital. If you can get eight hours of sleep a night, that's wonderful. And if you aren't getting eight hours of sleep a night, if you are struggling, you can go onto Google and you can type in remedies for poor sleep or something along those lines and all types of information will pop up. And the importance of not looking at a blue screen for about an hour before you go to bed, the importance of having the temperature in the room lower than you would have it during the day, the importance of having room darkening shades so that it's very quiet and dark in that room, and the importance of it being quiet. Um, the type of mattress that you have, maybe you haven't changed your mattress in years, and, uh, and that mattress kind of has a sagging spot in the middle um, from, from where you lay every night. And maybe it's time to, to get a mattress that supports your body a little bit better and, and that will help you sleep a little better also. Uh, reducing stress. Well, there are a couple of ways to reduce stress. Um, one is to remove the stressor. And so if there's something that's causing you stress, uh, just either eliminating it or reducing it, but that's not always easy to do. Um, so how do we cope with stress? Because if we can't eliminate stress, we have to cope with it. And there are different coping mechanisms out there. Exercise is a coping mechanism. Sleep is a coping mechanism. Meditation is a coping mechanism. Getting together with friends and family is a coping mechanism. My son had a, an unusual one, and it seemed to work really well for him, is when he was in his late teen years, he uh, started to play video games. And of course, as a, uh, as a father, I was not thrilled with that idea. I didn't want him to be spending as much time as he was spending in front of a screen playing video games. And one day I came into his room and I, I just sat there for a half an hour and I watched him play one of those games. And the game was so immersive. It took so much concentration that basically it was meditative. It was his meditation. He did it by being active, by actively playing a video game, but nonetheless, the rest of the world just disappeared. It was as if he were meditating and that worked for him. So there are creative approaches that you can take to reduce stress also. And getting involved with a group, a local group that practices wellness can go a long way to helping to keep you fit. So what about cognition? Some of the challenges that we have as we age from a cognition point of view is that we have a reduction in our sensory perception. And so those senses that we have used our whole lives to bring us information, information that we process to tell us about the world around us, our sense of smell, our sense of hearing, our sense of sight, they tend to degrade. We may have short-term memory issues. We may find it challenging from a mental processing point of view. Just trying to do that crossword puzzle is a little bit harder now than it was a decade or two ago. We become fatigued mentally quicker and more easily than we did when we were younger. And we struggle with multitasking. There may have been a time that we could juggle a number of balls all at the same time. And now maybe we can juggle one or two and that's about it. And our reaction times tend to slow. So how does that play out? Well, in the cockpit, it can make it more difficult to understand complex ATC instructions. It can make it more difficult to understand complex avionics, especially if you grew up in the time of the steam gauges. If you grew up with the typical six pack of flight instruments in front of you, and you have recently transitioned 
to a full electronic panel, you may find that challenging. You'll find with the electronic panel, there are multiple ways to do things. You can do it through the push of a button. You can do it through the twist of a knob. You can do it by programming it. You can do it by um, pressing a soft key on the screen. And because there are many different ways to do one particular function, for instance, change a re radio frequency, it can be confusing and you have to get the technique down that works best for you. But we can find performance planning to be a little more challenging and prioritizing. Prioritizing and prioritizing is important. What is it, especially in a busy environment, in a busy flight environment, perhaps as we're approaching an airport, it might be a new airport, it might be an airport that we haven't been to before. Maybe we're taxiing out for the first time at that airport. Maybe we're landing at that airport for the first time. What are our priorities? What is it that we should be doing? Where does the checklist fall in there? Where does the passenger briefing fall in there? What ATC instruction should we be paying the most attention to at this moment? What should we be expecting? What should be the next thing that happens? And trying to prioritize that can be a little more difficult. Dealing with emergencies, our reaction times tend to be slower as we get older. And so there is an even more emphasized need to practice those emergency situations. What do we do in an engine out on takeoff? What's the minimum altitude that we'll try to turn back to the airport? What will we do if we lose the engine at altitude? What do we do if we have an electrical system failure? Practicing those emergencies is important because it helps to imprint them into our long-term memory and our short-term memory so that we'll be able to apply those. We'll have the muscle memory, the mental muscle memory to prioritize things and to deal with those emergencies should it happen. And how do we deal with passenger demands? Passenger demands can, can seem overwhelming at times. And we talked about one of the solutions to that earlier with briefing the passengers thoroughly. So what type of remedies can we have for this? Well, training, train, train, train. One of the things we saw from the studies that have been done on general aviation pilots is the importance of experience and the importance of currency. And that centers all around training, training and practice, training and practice. Get out there and fly, keep doing it. Work with an instructor on a regular basis. Keep your cockpit organized it will be easier to prioritize and easier to decide what has to happen next if you don't have all of the devices that you're using, your iPad, your charts, your whatever it happens to be scattered all over the place. Use a checklist. Checklist usage is extremely important. In fact, all of us here in New England on the FAST team are starting to see a trend arising in the accidents and the incidents we deal with that points back to improper use or lack of proper use of a checklist. So use those checklists. We've talked about passenger briefings already. It may be time to scale back a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a few slides from now. Make sure that you, 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 you are properly, you know, you, you get a proper diet, you eat good foods, you get plenty of rest, and learn a new skill. And the new skill can be an aviation skill. You can check out in a different aircraft. You can go to a different airport. You can try a different type of flying. Maybe you've, you've, never, you've never flown in the mountains and you're gonna be doing a trip out west for something and you wanna take a mountain flying course. You can learn a new skill, but it doesn't have to be an aviation skill. It could be a skill that can help you around the house. It could be a skill that's based upon a hobby. Maybe you've always wanted to learn photography and, Hey, now's a great time to learn photography. But basically what you're doing is you're keeping those neurons firing. You're building new neural pathways. You're, you're, you're helping to uh, kind of augment um, and, uh, and offset um, any natural aging process that might be happening from a neurological point of view. So get out there and, and learn a new skill. And then in external factors, the emotional factors or psychological factors, or medications. And what type of things, and how can that play out? Well, it can create difficulty with our ability to focus. Certainly if we're emotionally distraught about something, 
our ability to focus is going to be on the source of the stress and not on other things. And so it can play havoc with our ability to focus. It can distract us. And we can reach a state of resignation where you just say, I give up. I, it's, it's, I, this is just not going to work. The effects of medication can take their toll on us. And these aren't just prescription medications. These are also over-the-counter medications. Uh, right across the board um, in accident incident analysis, we are seeing, and it's not just in New England, this is a national trend, we are seeing more accidents and incidents in which the pilot had medications, either prescription or over-the-counter or a combination of the two um, in his bloodstream um, at the time the accident happened. And so as we get older, there is a tendency for us to have to take more medications. And have we had that good talk with our doc? What about our family doc? Does our family doc know we fly? Because it's probably our family doc that's prescribing the medication. So if the family doc is prescribing a medication for high blood pressure, and then maybe the family doc prescribes a medication for gout, and then maybe uh, it's, it's spring and your allergies are kicking around. And so, you know, you go to the store and you get some allergy medication. Fast in Boston Fast Team YouTube site, you'll see that we have a, a um, webinar, a recorded webinar in there on pilots and medications. And, and I would encourage you to go take a look at that because that goes into it much more in depth and in much more detail. And of course, the effects of alcohol. Hey, John, this is Steve. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, I think that maybe is a positive for all of us as we get older and more mature um, is I think we probably recognize better the impact of some of those things like over the counter medications and all of that. You know, maybe our bodies tell us a little bit more as we get older, but um, that's definitely something I've recognized as I've moved in my aviation career from that young pilot to the middle-aged pilot to the more senior pilot. And, you know, things that I would have done or dealt with and maybe even not checked in terms of like over-the-counter medication if I had a cold or something like that, or even flying with a cold, I, I'd jump right out there and and probably do it, which wasn't the smartest thing. But as I get older, I've definitely seen the impact and even seen the impact on my cognitive skills, my motor skills and all of that. And really, you know, I've learned to just say no, <laughs> you know, time to stay on the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Steve. And and there are there are a number of different resources and places where you can go. I mean, you can call your your um your AME, your medical, your aviation medical examiner, and ask the question, you're taking this particular medication, that particular medication, can you use that when you're flying? Uh, again, I'll refer back to AOPA, those of you who are AOPA members, uh, they, they are extremely helpful uh, when it comes to that. You can go online and you can download a list of the medications um, with which you should not be operating an aircraft. So there is information, there is help out there. And, uh, and, and you bring up a great point, Steve, is, is as we do get older, uh, you know, we, we should be coming um, more aware of that and to, to check on that and to make sure that we're staying safe as far as medication is concerned. So let's, let's talk about some of the external factor remedies. Understanding meds, which we just talked about, and family and friends, you know, the importance of family and friends. And what I'm going to talk about here is I'm not just talking about getting older as a pilot. As we talk through these particular external factor memory, remedies, excuse me, I'm also talking about getting older as a person, just for all of us, right? I mean, I'm 62. I see from the poll that many of you are older than 60. And how do we just deal with that? Aside from the fact that we're pilots, how do we deal with the fact that we're getting older? Well family and friends, spending time with family and friends, spending time in social outings. And why? Because we're tribal. We're tribal. When our great, great, great ancestors pulled themselves out of the alluvial mud and began to walk upright, they didn't do it by themselves. They did it in groups. It's built into our DNA. 
it's built into our collective unconscious to be with other people. And being with other people is a tremendous um, source of support. It's a tremendous source of sharing. It's a tremendous source of bolstering ourselves as we age. Spirituality. And when I talk about spirituality, I am not necessarily talking about religious belief. Although, if religious belief is um, something that's important to you, then yes, falling back on that particular type of spirituality, connecting with people through that particular source, seeing a greater purpose in life. And if a particular religious belief isn't something that you are comfortable with, then a, just a sense of wonder, just to walk outside on a nice day, just to hear the birds and the, and the, and the, and the insects coming back in the spring, just to enjoy a beautiful sunset, just to go to the shoreline and listen to the waves, to look up into the sky at night and see all of those stars, to realize all of those points of light are other stars and have a sense of wonder at the entire universe. Because all of that can bring you to a sense of purpose. And as we age in particular, a sense of purpose is vital. And so I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories here. I was wandering through an airport one day and I came across a book. I was between flights and I came across a book and I don't remember the exact title of the book, but basically it was something along the lines of you don't need a million dollars to retire. And of course I knew I wasn't gonna have a million dollars when I retired. So I thought that would be a good book to pick up and read and so I did. And it was really interesting because what the author did was in the first chapter, the author made a statement and he set down a premise and the other chapters were just supporting chapters. And basically in the first chapter, he said, you really need four things to be happy in retirement. He said, the first thing is you need to reach that bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you need food, shelter, water. That's a basic, we all need that. But beyond that, you need your health. And that health is something that you can start working at when you're very young. So that by the time you get to be older, you'll still have your health and you won't have lost it. He said you need social connections. Back to the fact that we're tribal and we need to have other people in our lives. We need to be able to share. Our lives aren't solo journeys. It's a, it's a team journey. We go through life with people and we need to have those people around us. And then we need to have a sense of purpose. We need to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And that, as the author said, if you have those things, then you can make $20,000 a year in retirement and be happy, or you can make $200,000 a year in retirement and be happy. And if you don't have them, you could make $20,000 a year in retirement and be miserable, or you can make $200,000 a year in retirement and be miserable. But I think it was the sense of purpose that focus that the author had that was really kind of important and struck me because I had read another book and this was a book by Viktor Frankl and Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Men's Search for Meaning. And he was an Austrian psychiatrist and in World War II, he was interred at the concentration camp in Auschwitz. And you can imagine the atrocities that he lived through and that he experienced during his time there. And while he was there, though, he wasn't able to separate his professional life from what he was going through in his personal life. There was a part of him that kind of stood back and there was a part of him that objectively observed. And one of the things that he objectively observed was that it wasn't always the healthiest of the prisoners who died. And it wasn't always it wasn't always the weakest of the prisoners who died and it wasn't always the healthiest of the prisoners who lived. And although that did happen, it was a disproportionate number of relatively healthy prisoners who didn't make it. And there were a disproportionate number of kind of weaker and sicker prisoners who did make it. And the common denominator seemed to be their sense of purpose. 
the ones that could see some type of purpose in the suffering that they were going through were the ones that tended to make it. Now, that purpose may have been to get revenge on their captors. That purpose may have been to continue what their life's work had been. That purpose may have been to see other loved ones. But that sense of purpose was that strong. And so when we talk about remedies for these external factors, for the emotional and the mental and the psychological challenges that come at us as we age, well, it is these things that we can kind of fall back on. The social gatherings with our friends, our senses of spirituality, of seeing a purpose to our lives and having a sense of purpose. So let's move on. How do we stay sharp as we age? Well, one of the ways we do it is regular training. And regular training can mean an annual flight check. And I know what you're thinking, an annual flight check. Wait a minute, the regs already require me to go for a, a flight review every two years. Why should I do it annually? Well, Steve actually had something to say in a webinar the other night on proficiency, which I thought was great. And, and what Steve was saying was that if you are at the age that you're retired, that might be the age at which to start an annual flight check. So get together with a flight instructor. The regs say that you have to have a flight review every two years. It, there's nothing in there that says you can't have a flight review every year or that you can't have a flight review every six months or three months or two months or whatever it happens to be. Get together with an instructor and and uh, start having an annual flight check instead of a uh, flight check every two years. Yeah, Join a flying club mm. where that helps with the social aspect too, right? You're there with other people and you're out flying and, and you're in a club environment. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Oh, I just was going to mention with what you were saying about that. What Steve, did you want to say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just was going to mention is when we've looked at the kind of accident and in incident history. Yeah, I can the, hear you fine. In the Boston area is the two kind of areas that we saw problems or when I say problems, the type of people that had an accident or an incident tended to be people that had just gotten a pilot certificate or rating and did not necessarily have built up the experience with that certificate or rating yet. Uh, so, you know, had done the training or qualified as a flight review um, in less than a year with a new certificate, or those that were very close to the end of the 24 month period and the older, more mature pilots. That's where we saw kind of the two groupings um, with it. And that's why it just really is so important. if you've reached that age where, you know, you can retire from work, uh, you know, not saying financially or whatever, each person is different, but if you've reached that age where society is kind of saying you should be able to retire from work, that's the point you really need to be doing an annual proficiency check. And I think we lost you there, Steve, but um, Steve's point is, is, is very well made. If we're reaching that point that society says we should be retiring, that's a great, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Steve, you're back with us. No, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> well, see folks, this is what I meant about audio difficulties. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. So we do experience them, this we do. Um, so try something new and set some goals for yourself and, and, uh, and, and work to achieve those goals. Okay, so let's talk about our responsibility. Let's talk about what happens as we reach that point that we start to see a degradation in our performance. And we, we start to see that because we've set not just goals for ourselves, but we've set standards for ourselves. We have set benchmarks. And by benchmarks, I mean triggers that if we rec if we start to see a particular behavior, if we are constantly um, having difficulty with ATC clearances, if 
um, you know, we're having difficulty uh, with uh, complex airport operations. Um, whatever benchmarks you set for yourself, that we start to reconsider whether or not it's the time to start to back down a little bit. And so how do we back down? How can we continue to fly if we start to hit those benchmarks that we've set for ourselves? If we start to see that our performance and our abilities are degrading, how do we back down? Well, one of the ways is to fly familiar routes. Rather than go into uh, Boston Class B airspace just because you can, maybe that's not a great idea. Maybe it's not a good idea to be going into that really, really busy airport or taking that really difficult route. Maybe you want to stick with something that you know and something that's familiar and something that you'll be able to handle more easily. You might want to reconsider IFR. And we've run into this. I've seen this. I've, I've seen pilot deviation reports come into our office from a pilot who would uh, operating IFR, an older pilot operating IFR who turned the wrong way on departure. And ATC talked to them about it. And a couple of weeks later, again, on an IFR flight, um, failed to follow an ATC clearance. And ATC talked to them about it. And a few weeks later, in another IFR flight, uh, again, failed to respond to or follow an ATC clearance. Um, so we might want to consider IFR, reconsider IFR and whether or not we want to be out there. And we could do that in kind of a graduated way. So maybe when we first start to step back from it, maybe we step back and we say, well, okay, we're not going to do hard IFR anymore. We're not going to do the, uh, the approaches to a you know, 200 foot ceiling and a half mile visibility. Uh, we're going to back off of that. We want to raise those minimums. We want to set some personal minimums for ourselves. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go IFR if we have to pop through the clouds at 2,000 feet um, to get on top, but you know, we'll set a ceiling of 1,000 feet or a ceiling of 2,000 feet and higher visibility minimums and, and slowly back away from it that way and maybe at some point reach the point that we just don't fly IFR anymore. We might want to reconsider whether or not we want to be out there flying at night. It's just a little bit harder at night, isn't it? And we know that our, we don't process oxygen as well. We know that our vision is affected. We know that we need more light to stimulate our photoreceptors and there just isn't that much light out there at night. So maybe we want to back off of that. Maybe we want to stay in uncongested airspace and maybe we want to double our planning time. And so as our responsibility goes, we have a responsibility as we age to ourselves. And we have a responsibility to our passengers. And we have a responsibility to our fellow pilots and to the industry that we represent. And how do we become superheroes as we age? Superheroes of responsibility. So I want to tell you a story. And the story goes like this. When I was a young inspector, I was in my 40s someplace. And um, what we do at our office and at most of the uh, Flight Sanders District offices around the country is that we have a, um, a roster for phone duty. And what phone duty is, is uh, phone duty is that you're, if, you, if you have phone duty that day, you handle all of the phone calls, the random phone calls that come in. You also handle any walk-ins. Well, you know, in today's era, we don't do walk-ins at Fizzos anymore. Everything's by appointment. But back when I was in my 40s, we did walk-ins. And one day I had the phone duty and I was working at my desk and the phone rang and it was our our administrative officer up front, and she was telling me that there was a gentleman that had come in and needed to see an ops inspector, and I was on the duty that day, so I went up to up front to meet him. And when I did, and I first saw this gentleman, he was uh, obviously an older gentleman, and he was dressed in uh, a flight suit, flight uh, coveralls, and he had a, a mission patch on one of his arms and a squadron patch on the other arm. And uh, I introduced myself and we talked and I asked how I could help him. And he asked if we could go someplace and uh, to talk privately. And so sure enough, we, we walked into a conference room and I closed the door. And we sat down across from each other at the table and he hesitated for a few seconds. And I could tell that he was really nervous. And he reached into his pocket and he took out his pilot certificates and he put them down on the table and then he pushed him across to me. And as he did, his hands were shaking. And he said, I want to turn these in. I want to surrender them. And I looked at him and I, I said, well, well, why? And 
he said, well, he said, I'm, I'm 82 years old. He said, I've, I own an airplane. He said, I've scared myself a few times in the airplane recently. And he said, I, I don't want to become an accident. I don't want to become a statistic. I don't want to hurt myself or anybody else. And he said, if, if I turn these into you, he said, I, I know the temptation won't be there any longer. I, I, I won't be able to fly. And so I took a breath and I started to talk to him. And I talked to him about the level of responsibility that he was showing. I talked to him about the fact that he was one of those people who was self-aware enough, who was disciplined enough, and who was responsible enough to walk into a flight standards office and take these certificates and voluntarily surrender them. Aviation had been his life. He had started to fly. His father taught him how to fly. He was flying. He soloed when he was 16 years old. He went into the military. He flew P-51s in World War II. He flew F-86s when he came out. And when he finally retired from the military, he flew corporate aviation. He flew business jets for a corporation. Aviation was his life. He had owned half a dozen airplanes in his life. It was his identity. And I thought about what that took, what it took over the months that it took leading up to that decision to think about that, to process that, to come face to face with that, to deal with it, and to then come to the conclusion that he was going to walk into an FAA office and he was going to turn in these certificates that represented what was likely some of the most joyous and happy years of his life. And as we talked, I was able to show him that he didn't have to turn in his certificates, that what he was showing me in that moment was a level of discipline and a level of responsibility where he would take responsibility for his own actions and that he wouldn't go out there and continue to fly without somebody else in that airplane with him. And the FAA doesn't require a person to turn in their pilot certificates. It doesn't require that a person's pilot certificates be turned in when that person passes. And so those pilot certificates would be something that his children and his grandchildren could reflect back on, perhaps in a scrapbook or a family album, that that was what their father and their grandfather did with his life. And here were the certificates that had represented that. And when he walked out the door that day, he probably felt that I had given him a gift because I hadn't taken those certificates from him. But in effect, he had given me a gift. He had shown me what I had to do all those decades hence when I got to be his age. He had shown me how to be a responsible pilot. And so I've talked to you today and I started by telling you that the theme by which this entire webinar was put together, this topic was put together, was not to get across a message that you can't fly, but to get across how can you continue to do it safely as you get older. But I will say there's a catch to that. And the catch is you may be able to continue flying well into your senior years, but you may reach the point where you can no longer do it so long. You may reach the point where you have to have the insight, where you have to have the self-awareness, and you have to take on the responsibility of saying the days of flying solo and now in the past. Now I can continue to fly. I can continue to fly with a friend who's rated and qualified in the aircraft and is current. I can continue to fly with a CFI. I can continue to fly with members of my flying club who are qualified and current in the aircraft. But the day may come when you actually have to say, I can no longer sell off. And it's best to reach that decision through a quantitative approach. Set those benchmarks for yourself. What are you looking for? At what point in your performance and in your abilities, at what point do you make that decision 
And if you have some benchmarks set, then you'll be able to see more easily when you've crossed that particular benchmark and when it's time to start thinking about that question. And just because you aren't flying solo, or if you someday decide that just climbing in and out of an airplane is difficult enough that you step away from it. That doesn't mean that your days in aviation are over. We talked about purpose earlier, and purpose is so important. You can continue in this field that has brought you such joy and that has been such a passionate part of your life by becoming a mentor. If you're an instructor, you can still teach. You can still teach ground schools. You can get involved with the aviation career education camps, the ACE camps that take young people and show them what potential careers there are in aviation. You can get involved with maybe a local air explorer group. Again, it takes young people and kind of points them in the direction. So the time that you have built in this business, the experience that you have had and the flying that you have done, you can still stay a vital, important member of our aviation family, because it's our family. That's what it is. You're a member of a family here. And you can continue to do that. So in conclusion, we will grow old. And we can continue to fly, although maybe not so long. It's just that we need to be smart about it. And so let's go back to that question I asked at the very beginning. Do we need to be concerned? Our pilot population is aging. Do we need to be concerned? I think a better way to answer that is instead of saying yes or no, a better way to answer it is to say, what we need to be is we need to be smart, we need to be prudent, and we need to be responsible. And that's the answer to the question of do we need to be concerned? So here are some resources for you. So take a screenshot and I'll leave that up for just a few seconds. And we will be having a question and answer period in just a few seconds. So although I will end the formal part of this presentation by saying thank you very much for your time today. And I hope that you got something out of this. And we certainly appreciate you being with us on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, I'm going to end the recording now and we will uh, continue with our question and answers. So if you would like, stay with us. If you have other things to do, 